This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. During the last fiscal year, the Army alone missed their recruiting goal by 25%. All branches of the military are struggling to recruit new cadets. Today, we talk about the military recruiting crisis and what the armed forces are doing to attract eligible candidates into their ranks. We'll hear from Captain Benjamin Keffer, who's the commanding officer of the Coast Guard Recruiting Command. And later, we'll also hear how some extremist groups are working to get veterans and others with tactical experience into their organizations. But first up, we have Dr. Nora Bensahel, who is a professor of the practice at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a contributing editor at The War on the Rocks. It's a news platform for analysis and debate on strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. Nora, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. And for our listeners, we want to hear from you, too. If you're serving in the military or have served in the past or are considering it now, what made you join the military? Join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Nora, how have we seen military enrollment evolve and change from the time that we had a draft to where we are now, where it's mostly a volunteer basis? Yeah, today it is a completely all-volunteer force. Uh, Nobody has been required to serve in the U.S. military since 1973 when the draft ended after uh, playing a a very contentious role uh, in the Vietnam War. And right after uh, Vietnam, it was hard to get people to serve in the military, but as it's rebuilt itself over the years, the military has done very well in recruiting. The all-volunteer force has made the U.S. military one of the most powerful and capable militaries in the world, but it has had the unfortunate side effect of separating most Americans from the military. And today, most of the people who join the military have a family member in the military. As you said at the top of the show, that uh, the services are all facing recruiting crises, except for the Marine Corps. Um, and that number that that has just happened over the past couple of years. And so analysts like me have been trying to figure out among the many different things that are all happening at once exactly why that's happening. And so, of course, it's complicated, right? It's not just one reason. There are so many elements out there. So can you talk about what do military recruitment tactics look like and how did COVID impact this? Yeah, COVID had a tremendous negative effect on military recruiting because recruiting depends often on personal relationships with young people. Um, Military recruiters go into schools. Uh, They also network with other people uh, that the military calls influencers. That's not social media, but people who affect the decisions of a young person as to whether uh, they might want to join the military or not. So Uh, coaches, clergy, you know, all the other people, adults who might be involved in the life of a young person. Um, COVID also had made it, um, made many people were, have been um, not able to meet the standards to join the military. They're not eligible to join um, in terms of meeting academic levels uh, that are necessary, physical fitness levels that are necessary. Um, Some mental health conditions uh, are Uh, render you ineligible. And of course, we know those went up, especially among teens during the pandemic. So there's a lot of stuff going on on the eligibility side. Today, only 23% of young Americans meet the eligibility standards. That's down from 29% two years ago, which was already a low number. But to drop that much in two years is, is really what has caused the recruiting crisis for most of the services. Right. And then with you mentioning the number did COVID play a big role in, in in terms of impacting eligibility, or was that number some, or was that number something that was already kind of slowing down? Would you say? No, that number had been relatively constant for about a decade, and was projected by military recruiters to last about another two decades. Actually, they didn't expect that number to move. Again, um, in order to join the military, uh, in in order to enlist in the force, I should stress that this is uh, a crisis among enlisted personnel, uh, usually those who have a high school degree. The officer corps, which is made up mostly of college graduates, uh, they've had uh, no trouble filling their ranks. Uh, It's the enlisted force that is suffering. One of the reasons is that test scores have gone down, not just in the United States, but globally as a result of the COVID pandemic. The military, if you want to enlist, you have to take a standardized test called the ASVAB, and those scores have gone down quite significantly. 
And physical fitness levels have gone down very significantly as well uh, with, you know, schools being closed, team sports not being played and so on. Um, so there are a number of pandemic related factors uh, that have made that eligibility number go down. But I want to stress it's not just eligibility that military recruiters look at, right? Eligibility is one thing, but you have to convince people to serve. We, we don't have a draft, so everybody has to volunteer uh, in order for the, you know, the military to make its numbers. And there are a whole lot of reasons why what the military calls propensity, what, how likely are you to think about joining the military, that's gotten down in recent years as well. And I want to talk about the mental health as well as the physical health among young people that we saw skyrocket, especially during the pandemic. So how is that causing a decline in recruitment? And um, especially so we have a couple of colleagues who have served and they share their experiences where where when when they were a part of it, recruit, uh, it was considered um, it was pretty strict in terms of like diagnoses for autism or ADHD or various mental health illnesses. Those play a really big role in terms of whether or not you can be recruited. So is it still strict? Is it still the case? Or what does that look like today? Certainly, there are certain mental health conditions that should prevent you from serving in the military. Sure. The problem is that uh, some of the rather common ones, such as depression and anxiety, which many people, certainly not all people, but many people can be treated for effectively with uh, very common medications. If you have a condition uh, like depression or anxiety and you're being treated for it, it renders you ineligible to join the military. One of the interesting things is if you're already in the service, if you're already wearing a military uniform and you develop those conditions and they can be treated, you are allowed to stay in the military, but you're not allowed to enter it if you do. Um, and in, in my writings and research, that's one of the things that I've argued should be changed because it makes no sense to me to have uh, a stricter uh you know, restriction on entering the military that you don't have for people staying in the military. It means people can, if people can continue to effectively do their jobs, it strikes me that it shouldn't make a difference. But uh, those are the rules as they stand today. And how dire is this recruiting crisis? You now, what are, what's the data telling you? The data is showing that the numbers of people joining the military have declined uh, in every service but the Marine Corps in the past two years. And, uh, and by some very significant numbers, the U U.S. Army in the past two years has gone down by 25,000 people. And that's simply because people won't join. Uh, there's a, a supply problem. You know, a lot of people say the U.S. military is too big or and its size should be cut. And I think that's a very worthy debate, but you have to judge the size of the military based on what you want the military to do in the world, right? What is the strategy? And so it's very concerning to me and to people who follow the military and particularly to military leaders that the force right now is shrinking solely because people aren't willing to join, not because we've done an assessment and says, OK, we're going to change what we're doing in the world. We should be more deployed at home or so on. The number of people in the military should be tied to what the strategy is. But the numbers are going down for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with strategy. And that risks that the U.S. military will be too small, too shorthanded to deter the kinds of wars uh, that we want to deter. And if deterrence fails, to fight and win American wars. And so I guess so the question is, you know, is there really a need to have a military as large as we have have had in the past? So when someone asks that, you know, what do you say, especially Currently, you know, we got out of Afghanistan. We have a war in Ukraine and various, you know, other wars. So, what do you what do you say to those who ask this question? Well, the current defense strategy, and it's been relatively consistent even during the Trump administration. This is not just a, a, the Biden administration. Um, calls for the U.S. to play a fairly active role in the world, um, particularly concerned with a rising China, the possibility of needing to defend Taiwan if it were invaded. And of course, as we've seen uh, in Europe, Russia launching a, a tragic, unprovoked war of aggression in Ukraine, which threatens um, all of our European allies in that area and many of our partners. So again, I think you can debate what the U.S. military should be doing in the world, whether those are the right things to be focusing or not. 
But if those are the things that our strategy says that we're going to do, and again, that's been a largely bipartisan view, even under the Trump administration, then it is very concerning that the U.S. military is getting smaller because it means it will not necessarily be able to address those challenges to U.S. security. And with so many things going on now, is this next generation of potential candidates simply uninterested in joining the military? You know, what are you hearing So now that gets to the propensity question, right? How likely are you to want to join the military if you're eligible? Um, And there's, again, a number of things that are all going on at the same time. One of the things that I think most people don't realize is that the military, joining the military has very much become a family business. About 1% of the American public serves in the military, but it's not a random one person out of 100. As I said, for some of the services, as many as 80% of those who choose to join have a family member in the military, and as many as a third have a parent in the military. So we're seeing it's the kids of people who serve or other family members who are joining, uh, who are who are most likely to join. And whenever you rely on one piece of the population, your recruiting strategy is fragile because if that piece of the population decides that they don't want to serve anymore, you're going to have problems recruiting. There's a number of things going on right now that suggest that's the case. Uh, part of it has to do with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which uh, many veterans of that conflict Uh, even though many of them did support withdrawing, the way that it was handled and the the haunting images from the Kabul airport uh, really have uh, emotionally affected many of those who served there for understandable reasons. Um, So if they're telling their kids not to join or their uh, kids are seeing them uh, being very unhappy about that happen, that could be having an effect. We also see a debate uh, largely uh, among Republicans in Congress alleging that the U.S. military is too woke to be effective. The argument goes that they're focusing too much on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and that's undermining military effectiveness. That is not true. It is not accurate. The military services actually are having uh, record retention rates. People who are in the military want to stay in the military, and you would think that would go down if the military was becoming less effective for any reason. But that narrative persists, and that's convinced a lot of people believe that that is true, particularly on the Republican side. And we know that the military tends to be more Republican than Democratic. And so that narrative has had a big effect, even though it isn't true. So there's a whole lot of things that are going on at once. And and as you said, there's so much going on that you can't piece out. This is the one that's having the biggest impact. There are just a whole lot of things all swirling around at once that are leading to the crisis that we're in today. And so with with the family business, as you said earlier, how is public perception of the military and the culture of the military impacting enrollment, especially you know if they, if they don't have a family member or friends that are in it, how does that impact those who may or may not want to enroll? It, well, I think, again, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think, is having an effect in a different way on people who don't know anything about the military. Uh, Americans believe their military is very strong and capable, and of course, that's true. Uh, but, you know, they saw the images from the Kabul airport as well. Um, and I think many thought that that indicated that, the, you know, the U.S. military was not particularly competent. Again, that's not a correct conclusion. That was an incredibly difficult military operation for some very specific tactical reasons. Uh, but I think that has affected uh, most Americans. They also are so in, so ignorant about the military that sometimes they can't tell who's in the military and who's in other civilian uniforms. I mention that because confidence in the military has gone down quite significantly since the summer of 2020 and the Black Lives Matter protests that were going on in many American cities. People saw people in uniform out on the streets and concluded that there were military forces there that were trying to keep order and they didn't like it. The fact is the vast majority of those people in uniform were civilian law enforcement, either from the federal government or locals, but they had very militarized equipment. And the National Guard, the mil- you know, which are military forces, were only out on the streets of two American cities. 
but most people thought the military was playing an inappropriate role by trying to quell domestic protest. So again, a whole lot of things that Americans who don't know much about the military um, are interpreting that aren't necessarily correct, but also, again, perceptions are reality in a lot of ways. It is affecting the decisions of people who, uh, you know, uh, in the age group that the military recruiters are most interested in. And so we've been talking about the recruitment crisis. So how is the U.S. military responding to this? And are they changing up recruitment tactics? You know, what are you seeing? They're doing a lot of things because uh, this is a huge strategic threat to the force and again to U.S. national security, uh, you know, because we want to maintain those capabilities as, as much as possible. The Army has been in the lead for a lot of these efforts because the Army had its recruiting crisis started a bit earlier. Its numbers, ha- it has not met its numbers for the past two years, whereas uh, the Air Force and the Navy made them two years ago, but did not make them uh, during the fiscal year that just concluded on uh, September 30th of this year. Uh, the Army has launched something called a future soldier preparatory course for uh, potential recruits who don't make the uh, correct score on the ASFAB and who are below the physical fitness standards. Uh, to try to bring them up to those standards uh, if they're eligible in other areas. That has been so successful uh, that the other services are replicating it actually. Um, and in fact, we we can tell from the early data that the folks who go through that program are more successful in boot camp uh, and may take more leadership positions in boot camp, likely because they've already been in a military environment for anywhere between three to six years. So that's one way the services are immediately trying to address uh, the eligibility aspects. But the Army also just announced this past week that it is fundamentally changing how it's doing recruiting. It used to be that it was a secondary assignment. You had your primary specialty, you were an infantry officer or military or you know, uh, enlisted person, um, military intelligence, uh, logistics, whatever it was, and uh, you sort of randomly got assigned to be a recruiter. This past week, the Army announced that they are creating a specialization in recruiting so that people will get more training, they will do it for a career, and the hope is that will have much more of an effect. But again, uh, all of these measures are good ones, but the problem isn't necessarily going to go away because of some of these uh, issues, because of the scope of the eligibility issue and how few Americans are eligible. And then again, the propensity. Most Americans who don't know anyone in the military are never likely to consider a career in the military. And so the services are trying to do things to connect more with the American people to try to change that. But that's something that's going to take years. That's not going to solve the eligibility crisis, uh, the recruiting crisis in the next year or two. Those are some long-term efforts that they hope will bear fruit. But you have to start those now in order to expose more Americans to the military uh, for them to consider military service in the future. Well, and with your list of the scope of all the elements of any reasons why a person will want to enroll or not enroll, can you also talk about how have increased allegations of sexual assault or racism in the military? Has that been impacting this as well? It has. Again, it's hard to know exactly how much, uh, but we do know, for example, um, that when young Americans are surveyed as to reasons why they might join or not join the military, 30 percent of them respond that they're afraid of uh, becoming uh, a victim of sexual assault or sexual harassment. Now, they're allowed to pick multiple answers. So, uh, you know, that's not to say that's the only thing that's keeping them from military service. Uh, but that is a significant problem. And of course, that has been a chronic problem in the U.S. military for for years, really, you know, going on a, a, a decades now. I, I do speak with senior leaders in all of the military services. And, and one of the things that I tell them is that they should be talking about how in the past year, uh, incidents of sexual uh, or reports of sexual harassment or sexual assault no longer are managed through the military chain of command. You don't go to your commander anymore. Uh, There is now a separate reporting chain for those things that is independent. And I think that will be, I hope, reassuring to many folks that the military is taking this problem. Uh, You know, there's now a potential solution there that could uh, help affect uh, the the help reduce the numbers of people who suffer from that. 
there are also, um, you know, the the fact that there are many veterans who are have been publicly identified in extremist movements, particularly uh, the January 6th insurrection, uh, feeds a perception that the military is made up of extremists. That's not true in the active force uh, in terms of the numbers. Uh, it is a larger problem in the veterans community, but that also shapes people's perceptions. Uh, and so that can be a, a turn off as well. So there's there's lots of stuff all going on at once. Again, that makes this such a a wicked problem. Uh, that's a you know term that that social scientists use for something where there's just too many causes all affecting the same dynamic at once. It becomes very hard to piece it apart uh, and you know try to address each of the many many things that's contributing to the problem. You've been listening to Dr. Nora Benzel. She's a professor of the practice at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And coming up next, we hear from Captain Benjamin Keffer, who's the commanding officer of Coast Guard Recruiting Command, and hear how this branch of the military is addressing the crisis that we've been talking about. Have you considered joining the service? If you're serving the military or if you're a veteran, we want to hear from you. Give us a call, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Today, we're talking about the military recruitment crisis. The Coast Guard Academy is located right here in Connecticut, and the Coast Guard protects more than 100,000 miles of U.S. coastline and waterways. But according to the Government Accountability Office, the service has missed its recruiting targets for the past four years. But the Coast Guard is one of the several branches of the military that is struggling to meet its recruiting goals. And joining us now is Captain Benjamin Keffer, who is the commanding officer of Coast Guard Recruiting Command. Captain, thank you so much for joining Where We Live this morning. Catherine, good morning. Thanks for having me. And so, Captain, you've been listening to our conversation. We'd like to ask if you want to respond to anything that we've heard from Nora earlier. Uh, Most of what Nora said, I completely agree with in terms of the difficulties we're currently dealing with um, for Coast Guard recruiting. Um, The one point that I would say, I, I think the Marines would agree that they are also in a recruiting crisis. The fact that they they made their mission is is commendable, um, but they're also seeing the same difficulties that the other services are seeing um, in in recruiting young people to join their their service as well. And one of the things that I've I've said since I got into this role just a couple months ago was the Marines have a brand that allows them uh, a different level of exposure than than some of the other services, especially the Coast Guard. Right, everybody knows uh, what a Marine flag looks like. Um, But for the Coast Guard, sometimes we have to um, make a a more concerted effort to tell people what we are and who we are. And so we've been talking about the challenges with all the branches of the military. So what does this crisis look like specifically for the Coast Guard? And what are some unique challenges the Coast Guard faces when we're talking about recruitment? Yeah, so in uh, the year that just ended, we uh, were able to complete about 74% of our enlisted active duty mission. So we brought 3,126 new Coast Guard members in, uh, but the goal for that year was 4,200. Um, so uh, obviously in a service that's a little bit smaller, when we miss by 1,000 uh, people, uh, that is going to have uh, impacts associated with you know, maintaining our ability to complete our missions which continue to increase um, and and right we are still out there on the water every day saving lives uh, we are still protecting the environment through envir- our marine environmental protection mission still doing all of those same things um, just now with uh, less people and and that's one of the impacts that's that's hitting us uh, right now and and that's what i'm currently charged with trying to address is making sure that those numbers turn around and we get people back Uh, back to the levels necessary to fully staff and complete those missions. And as we've heard before, you know, recruiters are often more successful when they're able to make one-on-one connections with potential recruits. And we talk about in-person events like going to schools uh, to talk to students directly. Did that change during the pandemic for the Coast Guard? And and what does that look like today? Uh, Absolutely. Um, the, The largest impact for us on the recruiting side 
was the ability to go into the schools and have those interactions on a one-on-one -on -one basis with um, all students. Because right? even if you have multiple interactions with someone, if they weren't considering the military before, if you're able to talk to them and explain the benefits and the different aspects of the service, especially for us, uh, we've got 11 missions. There are many things that people don't consider that the Coast Guard does every day, uh, simply because they may not be exposed to it. But when we lost two years of ability to go into those schools, um, we not only lost the access to those young people, but there was an impact to my recruiters having the training, that on the job training of knowing how to do it. So when we go back into schools and we started going back in earlier this year, um, we almost had to relearn how to have those interactions because two years of not doing something is a long time. So to relearn that takes, takes repetition. And being able to get back into the schools now is definitely having an impact, um, but we haven't been able to turn it around completely yet. And we talked about this a little bit earlier with Nora. This year, the U.S. Senate had launched a formal inquiry into the Coast Guard's handling of sexual assault allegations, finding that sexual misconduct have been ignored and covered up. So with the changing perception and cultural, cultural uh, changes, how is this and the public's perception of the Coast Guard impacting the recruitment? Are you hearing anything, seeing anything? You know, what does that look like for you? Our recruiters are often the first interaction that someone has with the service on a on a real one-on-one -on -one basis um, so we have heard questions we've received questions about the you know the, the reporting and some of the other studies that have been directed around sexual assault um, and the one thing that you know the recruiters continue to express is that we're not the same coast guard that we were two years ago let alone 20. Um, and that's not just operational changes that's changes to the way that we manage our workforce um, and the services continued focus on trying to remove sexual assault and sexual harassment from all aspects of, of the workforce. Um, but the other piece of that that we continue to focus on too is, is the recovery. So um, it, it's a message that we continue to have those conversations, um, but telling people that we are doing everything we can right now to ensure that we address those issues so that the next generation of Coast Guard members um, don't have to see the same type of reports that we're seeing now. And we also spoke about uh, meeting eligibility standards earlier. So how is the Coast Guard addressing that challenge of simply not having enough people who meet those standards? And, and so Nora mentioned the, uh, the Army Future Soldiers Program. And she did indicate that the other services are considering or, or implementing similar programs. And we are in the same place. Um, we are actually working with the Army to see if we could leverage some of their, their expertise after having, they've, you know, they've been doing that for almost a year now. Um, so we're looking at the same thing on the physical side. Um, on, the, on the education side, um, we have not instituted a program similar to that yet. Um, but you, we continue to keep an eye on uh, those metrics. And, and the one thing I will say is the standards haven't changed. It, it's a matter of ensuring that we provide the applicants who are otherwise fully qualified uh, an opportunity to come up to the standards that we are going to with, you know, hold uh, for entry into the military. Right. And then with physical fitness, we also talk about the mental health aspects as well. So we know that mental illness has skyrocketed during the pandemic, especially among the younger gen uh, population, as we talked about earlier. So do you think eligibility requirements sh should change so that a mental illness doesn't disqualify someone from service? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I'm, without, you know, getting ahead of, you know, policy change or any other changes that that may happen in the future, uh, we constantly look at every aspect of eligibility. Uh, it is something that is reviewed almost consistently, um, and that is obviously one of the things that's on the front of the, the minds of most of the people in recruiting is uh, understanding that if we're disqualifying more people because of a certain um, condition or conditions, um, is there a change necessary? And can those members that have those conditions, can they serve just alongside anybody who doesn't have that di same diagnosis. Uh, so those kinds of changes are constantly being looked at, um, but there hasn't been any yet. Uh, and we continue to work uh, with the other services to, to look into those things as well. 
And also, the nature of the kind of work happening in the military is changing. What kind of skill sets are recruits going to need in the future? You know, will this be geared more towards technology and STEM, you know, cybersecurity? You know, what is that like? So as I mentioned, right, we, we're not the same Coast Guard we were two years ago uh, and definitely not 20. And one of those biggest changes is the m- amount of technology involved in executing our mission. Even though the missions haven't changed, um, the technological advancements that have been put in place definitely require a different skill set for some of our people. Um, and recently we stood up a brand new rate in the Coast Guard that is the cyber mission specialist rate. Um, because they are charged with helping ports protect uh, their cyber infrastructure. Not only our traditional mission of protection of the ports, you know, on the water, uh, we're now, we have a group of people who are specially trained and and highly capable uh, of doing those types of very technological missions, um, all in the same effort to protect the nation's waterways, um, just from a very different perspective because of the change in technology. And right now, I want to take a quick call from Elizabeth, who is from Manchester. Elizabeth, you're on the air. you got about a minute here. Okay. Um, I am not in the military, but my daughter is currently serving in the Army. And uh, she got into the Army through ROTC at college uh, to help pay for school. Um, And she studied biomedical science and was hoping to branch a medical branch to so that she would be able to use her skills. Um, but she branched um, something else, and now she's a logistician, and um, the Army is not taking advantage of her skills. Plus, she is um, Asian, and she deals with a lot of misogyny and uh, racism and sexism, and um, she's had some real difficult um, times um, with uh, leadership, and um, that's why she's not staying in the military. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing your story and your daughter's story with us. We still have Nora from Johns Hopkins, who is still with us. Nora, can you respond to that? Is that something that you're hearing? Yeah, unfortunately, experiences like that uh, do happen. Um, I don't think they represent the experiences of most of the people who join the military, but obviously, uh, you know, the, the military works hard to make sure people's experiences aren't like what you just described. On the, uh, you know, not taking advantage of her her uh, background in education, this is something that many of the services are trying to address. In the past, uh, the military followed very much of an industrial model of personnel, which was there were jobs and there were people and they just got matched up. The Army, uh, again, I think is in the lead in this, though the other services have, have also taken strides in this area. They're looking at ways to improve what they call their talent management, uh, how they select people for different jobs, as well as how they manage their careers over time, um, hopefully to uh, avoid mismatches like that one. Well, thank you so much, Nora. And thank you to Captain Benjamin Keffer, who is the commanding officer of Coast Guard Recruiting Command, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Captain. Thanks for having me, Captain. And coming up next, we'll take a shift to look at a different type of crisis surrounding veterans and extremist groups. But first up, today is our fall fun drive. Connecticut Public is a listener-supported station. You can help support our station so we can continue to provide you with this kind of coverage. And here are two of my colleagues to tell you more. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shin. The transition back to civilian life is not an easy one. Veterans often have to navigate this all while managing trauma. And this makes some veterans especially vulnerable to getting recruited by extremist groups. Joining us now is Sona Kurt. She's an investigative reporter at The War Horse, a national nonprofit newsroom that covers military veterans. She's also the Rosalind Carter Mental Health Journalism Fellow reporting on extremism in the military community. And she's also a Coast Guard veteran serving from 2005 to 2014 and graduated from the Coast Guard Academy. Thank you so much, Sona, for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me, Catherine. So I want to jump straight to it. Can you help us understand why we are seeing military vets being recruited and targeted by these militia groups? Absolutely. I think it's really a supply and demand issue. Um, Extremist groups and and particularly militias tend to value veterans as members. They bring in tangible skills and experience, you know, whether that's weapons training or tactical movements or or just leadership. Um, And for these groups, veterans can 
really help lend an aura of credibility. Veterans, you know, are among the most respected groups in the country still. Um, but at the same time, there's really an issue of vulnerability on the veteran side. And like you mentioned, that's often in the, the time when people transition off of active duty. Um, you know, it's worth noting, of course, not every veteran struggles with this transition. But when you come off active duty, you're, you're moving often from this highly structured life with a steady paycheck, built-in colleagues, to what can almost feel like a foreign culture. Um, you might not have had a job interview before. You might not know what to wear to a civilian workplace. You might not know how your military skills and experiences fit in uh, to sort of the corporate world. Um, and you might be surrounded by people who, who don't know what you've done in the military, in some cases maybe don't agree with it politically, and certainly don't necessarily relate to the stressors you're dealing with. And so it can be a very isolating, destabilizing experience. Um, and for veterans looking for meaning, looking for camaraderie as they enter the civilian world, for some, they can sort of find extremist groups waiting with open arms. And following up on that, you also wrote a really in-depth piece about uh, about this, focusing on a veteran named Chris Buckley. Can you tell us a bit about his story? Yeah, sure. Chris um, is an Army National Guard veteran who, like you said, I spoke with um, when I first started reporting on this topic. He came out of the National Guard with chronic pain from a back injury. He came out angry at enemy combatants sort of on the other side of the world who had killed friends of his. He really was feeling isolated and misunderstood. Um, he, you know, had experienced trauma in his military ex experience, um, and he really missed the the community he had in the military. And so he basically went on Facebook looking for sort of local groups of people who were veterans, who were talking about their, the same things he was. And he found a Facebook group. He became friendly online with with some of its members. Eventually, friendly uh, in in real life as well. And it wasn't until he formed those personal connections that he learned it was actually a Facebook group for the KKK. Um, but by then he had sort of found the community he had he was really missing. And he also found that they really valued him ha as a member. Um, in some places, the KKK is transitioning to a more militia style organization, which it hasn't really been in the past. Um, but his weapons training, his tactical skills uh, was something that his local KKK really wanted. Um, and eventually he de-radicalized. He was helped by a former extremist. And he actually now works with parents whose children have been radicalized, as well as with other veterans who are sort of dealing with the same things he was. Um, but I, I feel indebted to him for sharing his story because I, I think it does showcase a lot of these things that veterans, um, you know, who are at risk of being radicalized, radicalized can, can struggle with as they re-enter the civilian world. Right. And as we've mentioned earlier, it's such a complicated process and there's so much nuance, you know, unless you really pay attention, it's hard to miss those nuances. Is there any evidence that these extremes, extremist groups are still recruiting active duty military members? Yeah, I think it's an ongoing problem. You know, I, and, and, and it's also worth noting that this is not a new problem. Um, we've known for a decades that that some veterans can be drawn to extremist ideologies. Um, you know, in the 1970s, the KKK operated out in the open uh, at Camp Pendleton. Timothy McVeigh was an Army veteran. Um, Randy Weaver, who uh, was at the Ruby Ridge standoff, he was also a veteran. So this has been around for a long time. Um, but what has changed, particularly since January 6th, is a willingness to talk openly about this, this problem. So it might seem like, you know, after January 6th, this this came sort of into public consciousness as a as a new problem. But in, in fact, we've been dealing with it for a long time. And I would say that that groups still very much value veterans as members and there is still recruitment going on. So we got about two and a half minutes left. So sorry to ask you this in such a short period of time. But does this speak to a deeper identity crisis around the military and military culture? You know, I think it's really important to note that a common thread talking about this issue, um, as well as what Nora and Captain Keffer talked about, is really the issue of the military-civilian divide. Um, the fact that the responsibilities of military service are are really shouldered by a smaller and smaller portion of Americans. Um, you know, there's increasingly separation between who serves in the military and who doesn't. Um, and we see that playing out in the recruiting challenges, but we also really see it playing out on the other side, right, as veterans come off active duty, transition back into a society that that doesn't necessarily understand their experiences. And so when I think about it as an identity issue, I think about it less so as that 
you know, the, the culture of the military has substantially shifted um, or anything like that, but more so that increasingly the civilian world doesn't understand what military veterans struggle with, what they've gone through, and military veterans don't necessarily get the support they could really benefit from as they re-enter the civilian world. So I've got about a minute here left, but I want to ask you any final thoughts that you would like our listeners to know about, you know, the world that you cover. Um, you know, I think that uh, what we do at my newsroom, The War Horse, is try to bridge this military-civilian divide, talk about how the, the conversations we're having as a country uh, fit into or, you know, it, are related to the military um, for a civilian audience. Um, and so, you know, as we talk about extremism um, and radicalization sort of in the country writ large, I think it's important to see how veterans fit into that while also realizing that, you know, it's it's of course not only veterans who are um, who are struggling with this. You've been listening to Sonar Kirk. Thank you so much, Sonar, who's an investigative reporter at The War Horse, a national nonprofit newsroom that covers military veterans. Appreciate your time and helping us understand this situation better. Thanks for having me. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download where we live anytime on your favorite podcast app.